Thanks, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm out here in the east, so it's 2.30 to me, but uh, maybe morning to you, depending on where you are. Appreciate you taking a couple hours out of your uh, busy schedule to, to listen to yet some more information on the new mortgage rules, and I, I would imagine that uh, you've probably been uh, dialing into some seminars or webinars and, and doing a lot of reading on these rules, and it's an awful lot to, to take in, that's for sure. Now, I, I will tell you one thing before I forget here. Uh, you, you have in front of you the, uh, um, the slide deck that we're going to talk about for the next couple hours here. But I'm, I'm planning on attaching some supplementary material as well when the, the Q&As are published. So when you log on and download those Q&As in a couple weeks, I'm, I'm going to include a couple things that I'm, I'm putting the finishing touches on right now. One is a, a much more detailed discussion on the ability to repay and QM rules, whether you want to call it a white paper or a memo, that type of thing. Uh, I'm putting together a, a detailed description of that, and hopefully you'll, you'll find that useful if you're struggling with the points and fees definition or what exactly you have to do to validate ability to repay, that type of thing. It'll, it'll have some uh, uh, concise information around that so you don't have to read a, a ton of law review articles that are 30 pages long. And then I'm also putting together a, a briefer kind of collection of some of the issues that we'll be talking here today. And of course, this is titled Strategic Decisions Around the New Mortgage Rules. And I'll, I'll talk about how we're going to frame this presentation here in a minute. But a lot of those decisions and questions that you all might want to think about or decide how you're going to resolve as part of implementing these new rules, I'm, I'm trying to put together a, a document. Well, I put it together. I'm just trying to, to finish it up here so it, it reads pretty well, and I'll attach that to the Q&As as well. So there is more material to come, so don't think that you're, you're just uh, going to have the material that you have in front of you today. So let's jump into things here and talk about what we mean when we talk about a strategic decision. You know, we as compliance officers... Uh, if you've been in the field for a few years, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, you, you get a rule, you see it published in the Federal Register, and we bury ourselves, we you know lock the door to our office, and we open up the Federal Register, and we read however many pages it is with the yellow highlighter, and then we make some notes, and we put together our implementation plan and, and timeline, and maybe set up some work streams and get the business people involved in order to make these rules come to life, so that by the time the implementation rolls around, you know exactly what you have to do and you know who's on the hook for doing it, and you've got your policies and procedures and processes all set up. Well, that's all fine and good. Of course, in January, we got six or seven of these rules, depending on how you're counting these things, you know, thousands upon thousands of pages of Federal Register to read, and all the new regs and commentary, and uh, um, a lot is changing, obviously. That's the understatement of the hour, to be sure. But my point in all this, as I went through all this information and the, the number of institutions that I'm now working with and talking to a lot of people, and it's not just banks, by the way. You know, mortgage companies are struggling with this. Any type of entity that has to originate, or doesn't have to, I guess, that it chooses to originate, a mortgage loan, consumer mortgage loan, is struggling with how to make these things actually come to life, and now we've got about 10 months to do so. So uh, I always say that compliance time is kind of like geology time. It, you know, a, a year is just a stamp of the fingers to us as a compliance officer to actually get something done and get the IT folks in line, write out the specs and change the procedures and do all the training and change the disclosures, there's just a lot to go through and not a lot of time to do it. And now we've got all these rules in front of us. And the, the risk that I see a lot of banks take, and I, I will explain it as a risk here, uh, is that we do what we've normally done, and that is lock ourselves in our office and read all the rules and figure out how we're going to make them come to life within 10 months. And that's all fine and good, and we do still have to do that. But in this instance, these rules are having such a fundamental change to the entire mortgage marketplace, like I state here on the second page, that it's more than an operational set of decisions that you have to make. There are a number of critically important strategic questions that come from these rules that will 
fundamentally change in, in some aspects the way you, you make mortgage loans, the products that you offer, how you market them, how you, you underwrite them and, and price them. You see the list of all the processes and uh, uh, parts of your institution, and these may be different folks depending on your, how your institution is structured here, that are going to be impacted by these new rules. Now, what the risk is, and again, why I present it as a risk, is these changes are going to have such a fundamental impact on the marketplace and how loans are priced, I mean, how the secondary market prices them, as well as how you're pricing them to consumers out here, and business models of some institutions out there that the last thing you want to have happen is once next January rolls around and, and things change, or maybe sometime in the meantime before then, your senior management or your board calls you in and says, well, I hear that this is what's going to happen with regard to these new rules. And you say, well, yeah. And then you, then you hear the question, well, why didn't we hear about this before? This is a fundamental decision that we are going to have to make as far as whether we want to be involved in this type of lending anymore. So my goal here in this two hours is to present a number of these questions and ways to think about these rules beyond just the compliance officer perspective. So in other words, think about whether you might want to do a presentation in front of your board during the next meeting or talk to your chief credit officer, product development folks, and the, the executive management of your institution and ask them very fundamental questions. This is what these rules are going to do to certain types of loans and products that we offer. Are we sure we want to continue to offer them? And I, I stated it that way, but you can state it the other way as well. There are going to be an awful lot of banks exiting the mortgage business, particularly some smaller institutions that just don't feel like uh, dealing with all of this and the compliance costs and hassles and resources that it's going to take is just going to be too much. And already I've talked to a number of bankers that are doubting whether they will stay in the marketplace. And if that's the case, and if a lot of lenders leave, or, uh, leave the industry around where you happen to be, that might create opportunity. So rather than making the decision to exit the marketplace, maybe you might be able to see some market share that will suddenly become available due to all these changes. It, it will likely be that uh, disruptive to the industry as far as the players and the, uh, uh, the way mortgage loans are handled. So again, when you're looking at that second page, a lot of other issues that you've got to contend with along with just the implementation issues when it comes to these new rules. So let's jump into things here and talk about some of these decisions. Now, I will not be able to avoid talking about some of the operational requirements of these rules to give some of these strategic questions context. Now, that being said, this is not a, a session where I plan on going over the specifics of all the rules. There are, are certain of these things that I will have to assume that you either know or at least are familiar with. Now, of course, you may have some questions around that. Happy to take those. So type them into Sam, send them off later. They'll certainly be in the written Q&A uh, after the fact. But uh, I, 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 to address these, these higher level strategic questions, I guess is the best way to put it, there are some of the operational things I will be uh, skipping over, plus you don't want to be sitting here for six or seven hours anyway. So let's look at the first one I've got here on page number three. And the question is, how are your underwriters going to adjust to these rules? And when you read what the new rules essentially say, you've got to validate the ability to repay for consumer mortgage loans. And if your first thought is, yeah, right, what's the big deal? This is not really a big change in how we're doing things presently, because especially after the crash, you know, you could say this is an example of the uh, regulators shutting the barn door after the animals have already uh, uh, long escaped. But, you know, no one's in the business of making no income, no asset loans or stated income loans or any of those types of products. But, of course, the regulators are trying to prevent the inevitable shift in the uh, business cycle where eventually somebody will start to make those loans again, and uh, if you've got doubts, I will tell you why that will happen here in a little bit when we talk about fair lending. It is inevitable. But the, the regulators say, yes, you've got to validate using verifiable third-party information the consumer's ability to repay that mortgage loan, and that's really the essence of ability to repay. But again, you say you're already doing that, that but the key now is you have to prove it in other words, you have to retain certain documentation around those eight underwriting factors 
to demonstrate that you are doing at least the minimum of what the regulation requires. So that's pretty much of an outline.